Uh, we've been going through Advent and there's Advent guides. I think Ali had shared that you can cram, you know, so if you've missed reflecting on Advent, you can get a whole month's worth in this last week before Christmas. But we've been doing, uh, we reflected the first week about how Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our joy. Last week, Jesus is our peace. And this week, Jesus is our hope is our theme of focus. And I hope that's not just what we reflect on here this morning, but you take that into your reflections during the week. And maybe if you're lucky, I might put up a, a, a screen later on with a whole bunch of verses that you could use to reflect on during the week if you're wanting that. Last night, we had some very good friends of ours over for dinner. Um, Brendan and Wendy Roberts, they're all the way back from Mexico, the missionaries over there. And he reminded me, that uh, he's about to turn 50 and he reminded me of what we did for his 40th uh, birthday. And that's how me and him and a bunch of other friends, we all went to Vietnam. Now, if you've been around the church, you've probably heard my war stories before, but we all, we all went to Vietnam on a, a motorcycle trip for 10 days, riding back country, cross country, this sort of thing. The only problem is, is I don't know how to ride a motorbike. But that didn't stop me going on an adventure. But into day two of this trip, I actually were like out in the middle of nowhere in the jungle, riding up this like this cliff, whatever you call that. And we're doing the thing. And uh, I, I, the bike slipped. It was a narrow passageway going up the side of a mountain. And I went to go put my foot down. There was nowhere to put my foot. And instead I fell about 10 meters onto like a ledge. Thankfully, it was only that far because after that ledge, there wasn't a, a lot left. And the bike came and landed that 10 meters and it landed on, on my side. And by some miracle, all that happened was I dislocated my shoulder and it, it took my, my shoulder, it took the, whatever this bone is, the humerus, uh, and it wasn't funny though, uh, and then it, it wedged it up under here instead and it was pinching all the nerves. It would be offensive to little girls, but I was screaming like one. Uh, I was probably screaming more than one. And so here I am in the jungle, lying on a cliff, thankful I'm alive, but also in incredible pain. So they threw a rope down to me, they pulled me back up the cliff, and they heard my screams from far away, you know, through their helmets, uh, and, and they pulled me back up, and then we tried a bush fix to try and get my shoulder back in. There was no doctor among us, no nurse, nobody with any first aid training whatsoever, but that's not going to stop 10 guys from trying to put a shoulder back in, okay? So needless to say, I was biting on someone's wallet, lying on the ground while five people pulled me in one direction and five people pulled my arm in the other direction, trying to get it back in. I can say we didn't get it back in, but we definitely made it worse, okay? Okay. So now, this, uh, this goes down as the longest day of my life. I was in incredible pain. Every step I took was like sharp, you know, 10 out of 10, very, you know, pointed pain as it was pinching everything. But I had a two hour walk out of the trail to the road. Then I had about a one hour wait while they pulled leeches off me. And then I had a four and a half hour drive of which all of my friends ditched me and I felt too bad to get any of them to come with me. So I had a four and a half hour drive in a bumpy van with my shoulder out. And in Vietnam, there's, there's mile markers and I didn't like them. Uh, because every mile that you went past would tell you how it's like 167 to the next town and then 106 and then 166. So it just made it feel like it took even longer, you know, as you count these things. And that wasn't counting to the town we were going to. That was just counting to the next place and then it would start again. And I can tell you in pain, in, in like agony, just the long day, I was just hope. You start to learn a little bit about hope in those situations, right? Hope is the desire that some good would happen and the expectation that you might obtain it. So from the moment the shoulder popped out, my hope was that I would get to a hospital and that a doctor would come out, 
in their little white lab coat and they would be able to fix my shoulder so that I would no longer experience pain. And all throughout this long and nine hour ordeal, that was my hope, that this good at the end of the tunnel would happen that I expected to obtain it. Some attempted to put their hope in money. Some attempted to put their hope in political outcomes. Some attempted to put their hope in other people. Some attempted to put their hope in the economy. Some attempted to put their hope in all sorts of things. But the Bible teaches us that it is God and God alone who should be the object of our hope, the object of our hope. First Peter 1.21, listen. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. I don't trust in anything God's going to bring me. I don't trust in any of the good stuff that's not God. I, the good sweet frames, but I wholly trust in Jesus' name. Before the birth of Jesus, it's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to, for it to come alive to us. But before the birth of Jesus, the world was longing. The world was in pain. The world was groaning. The world was pining. The world was waiting for the one who would come to put it out of its misery. The one who would come to put creation out of its misery and redeem all things. The one who would come to put humanity out of its misery and begin redeeming all things. And at the birth of Jesus, the object of their hope appeared. This is why all of like creation begins responding. The stars start aligning. The hope didn't appear like every, everyone expected a king to appear. You know, we're, we're waiting for the, the Prince of Peace. The everlasting father, the wonderful counselor, the one in whom the government will rest on his shoulders and his reign will never come to an end. But all we got was a baby in a manger. Nobody told the palace, nobody told the political parties, nobody told the rulers, nobody told Rome. You had to go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem's a backwater town at best. You couldn't find him in the hotel. You can find them in the barn. Instead of all the royalty around to celebrate the hope of the world appearing, it was just the lowly shepherds, a few foreign magi that had traveled across country and the angels because hope had appeared. What God promised was beginning to be realized. God promised to make all things right. God promised to redeem all things. God promised to save His people. God promised that all the nations on the earth would be blessed somehow through the lineage of Israel and the hope had appeared. God had shown up. What was promised had arrived. God is with us and the Saviour is here. I picture it like a dramatic war movie. It's like, you know, like normally in, in all good war movies, there's a point when it looks like the main characters are done for. It's like the enemy's pressed in, the enemy's gonna get the victory, they're running out of ammo, you know, the wounded are piling up, they're in a desperate situation where unless some external force shows up, there is no hope. This is the sort of drama of what's going on in the world. And then all of a sudden, hope normally is brought by an external force, somebody else showing up in your life, something. And then here comes Jesus. Hope appears. Sort of like the helicopter coming in just in time. 
or the air support or that other platoon finally arriving from the flank, Jesus appears. And his work of restoration of all things begins. He breaks the power of sin and death on the cross. He's resurrected. And his work of restoring all things continues today. It continues by his spirit and through his church. And he is coming back again. And so we wait in expectant hope for the one who has appeared to appear once again. When we look at the world, the complex conflicts, the wars, the economy, the changing landscapes and seascapes of our lives, it can seem so broken at times. It can seem so overwhelming. It's like a 10,000 piece puzzle without a picture. It can like, where do you even begin? Where are even the corners in this thing? It's going to take me forever just to find the straight bits. It can feel a little bit like that in our lives. Well, man, well, we got this needs to change and that would need to change and this would need to change and that would need to change. Where do we even begin? We begin with Jesus. We begin with Jesus. He is our hope. Maybe you've come here today and you don't know Jesus. Begin with Jesus. With Jesus, you can figure out all the other things. Here is some of what Jesus brings us. I think we've got these graphics. If you want to take a photo to go through the verses during the week, then feel free. With, because of Jesus, these are the things we can hope for. We can hope for deliverance from death. We can hope for deliverance from our enemies. We can hope for deliverance for eternal life. We can hope for freedom from oppression. We can hope for the fruit from our spiritual labours, for God's abiding presence, for God's unfailing love, for grace to be given, for redemption for our bodies, for the resurrection of the dead, the return of Christ, righteousness, security, the sharing of God's glory, and the hope of spiritual restoration. Jesus doesn't just come to give some ethereal hope. He gives real hope, real hope for what you need. It's all found in Jesus. And here's the power of the hope. There's another graphic here. If you want more Bible verse, I'm going to fill you up for your whole summer of reflective Bible reading. Hope epitomizes our faith. Hope equips us for spiritual warfare. We are not defeated. We are victorious. Hope gives assurance. Hope invite, invokes divine help. Hope is alive. Hope is intelligible. It's not blind faith. It's intelligible faith. Hope leads to rejoicing. It produces boldness. It produces godly living. It receives divine goodness. It strengthens and encourages. As the writer of Hebrews said, this hope is an anchor for my soul. This hope is an anchor for our souls. I was fishing this week. It was a bit windy out on the boat. A friend of mine, he didn't set the anchor properly. So what we thought we were going to be fixed, throw that anchor down and the winds were so strong, it was rocking the boat and it pulled on the anchor and it took us a little while to realise you know, I'm not very experienced at this whole thing, that we were moving and where we had thrown our anchor, it had given way. Isn't that what happens to us in our lives? We we come to know Jesus, there's a single-mindedness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. We throw that anchor, it's an anchor for our souls. It holds us in the storm, it holds us in the wind. But sometimes the anchor slips. Sometimes it slips onto other things. Sometimes it slips onto the sweetest frames. Sometimes it slips into completely ungodly things and we're trusting in all the wrong things. My encouragement to you as we come to the end of the year is throw your anchor one more time on the hope that is in Jesus. Throw it again. Throw it for the first time. Throw it. Even just make sure that it is on the right thing, because it doesn't just hold you, it will lead you. 
There's actually a, a second, there's anchors that hold you and there's anchors that you can pull on to get where you need to go. They're called kedging anchors. Back in the day, you know, you didn't have motors on ships and those sorts of things. If they had to come through tight bars and harbour entrances, they would take a smaller anchor, they'd put it on a long boat, they'd row it out in front of the ship, they would drop it down and the ship would pull itself forward on the anchor. If you got your hope in Jesus, it's something you can pull yourself forward on through life. Set your anchor upon Jesus because this is the hope, as Romans says to us, that will not disappoint. It will not disappoint. You will not be disappointed, friend, if you put your hope in Jesus. In fact, you will be most pleased the longer you go on in life and when you cross into eternity, it will not disappoint. Sometimes in our seasons of life, it might look like God's let us down. He's just bringing all things for good. It will not disappoint. Jesus is our hope. I wanted to just pivot from that, just to spend a few moments talking about next year with us, if I could. Um, I think it's important. We're talking about hope, talking about what do we have to look forward to as a church this year. If you've been a part of the journey, you know it's been a bit of a topsy-turvy year, and I do want to talk about next year. Uh, Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Isn't this so true in our lives? If we can't see what God is doing, if we've lost the God word, if we no longer have our eyes fixed on Jesus, man, we get caught up in drama. We get caught up in selfishness. We get caught up in all sorts of things, right? We stumble all over ourselves and all the people around us. But when you can see what God is doing, there's something about being able to fix your gaze, fix your priorities that helps lead you through life. And I wanna remind us again that God is at work in His church. God is at work in Curate Church and He is still leading. He's still the head. He's speaking, and man, we want to be a church that continues to follow His lead. We've got to learn from the past, but we can't look to the past. We've got to look to God's leading in the future, and God is speaking, and God is leading, and so I want to be someone who responds in faith. I want to be someone who follows His lead, who makes sure I'm guiding the people entrusted to us towards what God has revealed so that we would be most blessed. Many of you would know that in 2021, we announced a new vision for Curate that we felt God speak to Katie and I, and we called it Chapter 2. After many years, at that point almost 10 years of phenomenal growth, leading thousands of people to Jesus, planting churches, we realised this, that the church had grown beyond its discipleship capacity. The Sunday service capacity, the amount of people who came to this church was more than our ability to disciple them well. And so things were spinning a little bit. We realized that we'd gone beyond that. And so we cast a vision that we called chapter two that could be summed up with this idea of discipleship. Going deeper, going stronger, going slower. Not so God could do less, by actually strengthening the foundation so that God could do more, so that God could go wider, that God could go further, that the ministry could go longer through the grace of God. Matthew 28, Jesus said this, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples. Don't go make volunteers. Not go and make church services. Go and make disciples. And it's true that you can have a lot of activity happening in the church, but that doesn't guarantee that discipleship is taking place in the church. Churches don't need a follow-up strategy, they need a follow-me strategy. And so we reworded the vision to be a people pursuing the way of Jesus, 
and playing our part in his story. And ultimately, it's a vision of discipleship ramping up. Theologically, God has ordained at least three purposes for the church. I think there's three main purposes for every church. You don't get to make this stuff up. This is from the scripture. Number one, that the church is supposed to make sure that the Lord is worshipped. That the worship of the Lord is the priority. The second is that disciples are made. And the third is that the world is reached. This is the core purpose theologically of the church. We know it's his church. What does he want to have happen? He wants to be worshipped. He wants people to be discipled and he wants the world to be reached. But it seems that all of those three things require discipleship. It's disciples who worship. It's disciples who make disciples and it's disciples who reach the world. And so our focus for 2024, which is also the 25th year of Curate, it's an important year, will be discipleship. Discipleship will be our word for next year, our focus for next year. I think it's significant that at 25 years, that we're coming back to the very heart of what God is all about in his church. We'll build on the gains we've made this year in community because discipleship takes place in the context of community. But we'll ramp up a focus on discipleship, looking to strengthen everyone who wants to be strengthened in God next year. Now, we need a definition of discipleship. Some people are like, discipleship, yeah, that's when like someone meets with me one-on-one, we have a coffee, they speak into my life. Yeah, that, that's cool. That's mentoring, which is a form of discipleship, but we might just wanna define discipleship. This is how I like to define discipleship. Learning to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do like Jesus if he was you in your world. Helping teach people learn to be with Jesus, grow in intimacy, relationship, having a life in God. Be, become like Jesus, transformation of character, ultimately love and do like Jesus, which is, hey, our vocations, our ministries, our callings in our life, learning to live those out, learning to be a, a great uh, husband or wife, a great single person, learning to be a great fa- like member of your family, learning whatever God's called you to in your work, learning to do that like Jesus. And so... Discipleship's a nice word. I I didn't come here this morning expecting any resistance to this idea, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, of course, discipleship, that feels nice, that sounds awesome. But I just wanna set us up a little bit with our few more remaining moments because it ain't no walk in the park. It's way easier to talk about than for it to happen. And there are unique, you know, we're in a unique time in church history where we've got some real discipleship challenges to truly be the people of God, constantly becoming like Jesus within our modern world. And so I just wanna explore some of that idea for a moment. Now, the first thing I think we should know is that what are you, whatever you call it, the devil, evil, the world, this whole idea, their tools for forming us have increased a million fold in the last 150 years. If you go back 150 years ago, the only ability really for you to be formed by the world was relationally or active spiritual pressure in your life. Outside of that, there was very little ability for the world to form you outside of relationships. Then bring in like mass media through printing, then add the radio, then add TV, then wait for TV to get to 24 hours a day and a thousand channels, then put on demand, then put Netflix in there, then put social media on there. We are not blank slates when we come to Jesus. We are being formed almost every minute of every day. Some people, they just like, they scroll like this and then they go to sleep. That's when they stop being formed and then they wake up and start being formed again. Then you drive to work, listen to something being formed. Then you drive past a billboard that's advertising something and it's trying to you know, bring out longings in you. It's actually forming you. We live in a world that is discipling us in its ways, discipling us in its ideology, discipling us in its own version of things, discipling us. We are disciples, whether we like it or not. It's just the question of who we're being discipled by. 
And so this is incredibly challenging when it comes to the church trying to be discipled in the way of Jesus. We've all got rabbis, it's just who's yours? And while this has all been happening, while the world's ramped up its ability to form us 150 fold, 150 million fold, (laughs) while this has been happening, statistics would tell us that spiritual practices, both personal and corporate, within those who call themselves Christians, are declining, plummeting. So the world's forming us more and we're giving God less ability to form us. We're giving Him less space. People are so busy. Our work lives have increased. Our social lives have increased. Our kids' activities have increased. Our travel expectations have increased. Our holidays have increased. The caravan purchasing amongst the older people has increased. They're called the grey nomads. Don't see them from January through to Easter. Entertainment has increased. And what gave way, what's given way in our lives to allow for the increase in all of these things? Well, church engagement and personal spiritual practices. When I first became a Christian, Matt's actually here. He was there when I first became a Christian. He was a part of the church that I became a Christian in when I was 16. It was very normal in the way that I got discipled. Wednesday night prayer, Saturday night youth group, Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday morning church service, Sunday afternoon hanging out, talking about Jesus, random times praying and worshiping the Lord all over the place. Then you got all of the natural times hanging out where Jesus was clearly the center. And then I went within the next year, I went to Bible college for a few years to get formed in the ways of the Lord. Without intentional discipleship, you can't stay strong. You can't go through the storms of life, the seasons of life. But all of this is happening when you can't even expect Christians to be at church on Sunday morning. To expect someone to do 20 Sundays a year seems like a high expectation. Let alone all the extra things. And so now people want less activity, less demands, less attendance. And what it's revealed is that many people don't have enough of a life in God to sustain them, to get them through. So then if church, this is what happens, this is what I've observed happens over the years. People in their Teens and in their early 20s, highly involved in church, used to be at least, highly involved in church, lots of serving, lots of helping with things. Then they get married and have kids, and so it puts a natural stop to their ability to be involved in church like they were. And then what that's revealed, it throws them into this whole spin because they didn't have much of a life in God outside of church involvement. And so then like, it's like they feel empty, they feel like very confused, they start asking big questions, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but we probably should have been forming a life in God beyond church activity right from the beginning. Nothing wrong with the church activity, there's something wrong with not asking the deeper question. And we don't need people spinning out and losing their faith now that they're entrusted with the next generation and should be getting stronger in the Lord and passing that on and instead they're having a crisis of faith. This can't continue. This can't keep happening. We got people like, I, I, he was here at the 9 a.m., his name's Zach. We were meeting in a cafe this week, he's brand new at church. Led him to the Lord in the middle of Eddie's and Elspeth, gave his heart to the Lord, repented of his sins, it's amazing. But you know, we got new converts, he's hungry to be discipled. Are there any Christians that have time to disciple anyone anymore? to meet with that person every week, to pray with them, to open the Bible with them, to teach them to obey all that is commanded, to immerse them in the life that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Or is that just the professional's job? Or is that supposed to be all of our job? People are leading God's solutions to the challenges they face in life and they need to be discipled in them. And so I think, you know, why I come here going, discipleship's our focus next year, and everyone's like, yeah, that sounds awesome, that's so cool, with the discipleship. You didn't clap, but that's how I imagine it in my mind going. Um, I just want to say it's no walk in the park. See, discipleship in this day and age is radical rebellion. 
as radical resistance. It is a different life. Increasingly so, discipleship is going to feel like radical resistance. I want you to think of discipleship as rebellion. Now, when I went to school, I didn't grow up in a church family. I know we've got lots of great homeschooling families in this church, okay? But I just want to say, when I went to school, I thought people who homeschooled were so weird. Like, I thought that was so strange. Like, the thought that you would, like, do that. I just, that, that was, like, so foreign to me, right? It's like, it's rebellion. It's weird. It's resistance. It doesn't make sense to the world around you. Why would you do that? Now, in 2023, I'm probably saying almost every Christian family should probably homeschool their kids if you can. Right, because like such is the way the world, and I know we've got great teachers a part of the school system, I'm not making judgments here, right? But such is the power of the social interaction, such is the power of some of the curriculum, such is the power of some of those systems and its ability to form us in ways that are completely not of the Lord. Right, and so like all of a sudden that you just realize to raise kids this day and age means to say no to this, say no to that and do things radically different if you want kids that are gonna follow the Lord. They cannot be like the kids. You can't do all the sports, the music, you can't do it all and show a healthy level of connection to God's people. You just can't. So it looks weird. And here I'm just trying to say that if you really wanna follow Jesus seriously, it's gonna increasingly look weirder to the people around you, not more acceptable. It's going to require radical resistance. Big no's for your really big yes to Jesus. I think of it like a monastery. The people of God is like, I don't know if you've ever been to a monastery or driven past one. You go past, you're like, it's in the world, but it's definitely not of the world. Right? It's in the world, like the, the building, the walls, the structures, the gardens. But if you step into that thing, the whole rhythm and way of life is not of this world. The priorities are not of this world. It's radical resistance. This is increasingly what Christians should look like in their life together in this world. It's like to be a disciple is like swimming up river. It just is. It's like swimming up river. And if that's the case, then the church needs to be its own type of river so that when people are with their brothers and sisters in Christ, when we're in our Sunday gatherings, when we're in our prayer meetings, when we're in our small groups, it's like a river flowing in the other direction, very intentionally forming people in Christ so they can survive the rest of the time that they're swimming against the river. They need a river that can just flow them towards Jesus. And so here's my prayer. I'm praying for a fire to rise up and burn in Curate Church. I'm praying for a revival of our hearts. I'm praying for more disciples to be made and I'm looking forward to following Jesus into the discipleship focus for next year and I hope you are too. I hope that like just by the Spirit of God, there's something that would ignite in your heart, be like, yeah, I've got to grow in the Lord. Yeah, I want to get strong in the Lord. Yeah, I want to teach other people to be strong in the Lord. Yeah, Lord, send me. I want to go into all the world and I want to, bat I want to immerse people in the life that is Jesus and I want to teach them to obey all things because without it, without an increased discipleship focus, there's just not enough of a life in God to really help people. And so here's some practical things that are going to change next year to help us do this. Is this making sense? All right, I'll finish with this, okay, if we've got this. We're going to pause some things next year to help us do this, okay? We're going to pause the 6 p.m. gathering for next year. One, there's multiple reasons. One, we've got less staff, and it takes a lot of energy to do church all day, and we're not set up and strong enough to sustain that in a sustainable way at the moment. And so the 6 p.m. gathering is going to, to finish up for a year at least. It's going to pause. Now, this gives us a few advantages. It allows, for, certainly for like people like us who are normally here all day, it allows, it opens up Sunday afternoon and evening for more hospitality, for more picnics, for more meals. It opens up the extra events that we do, like team nights and different things. It opens these up to be able to be on Sunday nights and not compete with small groups and other ministries going on. So 
6 p.m. is going to pause. Curate College is going to pause. We've got a couple of awesome third-year students. We're going to still support them and take them through, but we're not bringing in any new students next year. We're going to strengthen all of these things, okay? We're going to strengthen our governance. We've already been adding board members. We're adding some more. We're starting eldership by mid-next year. We're going to strengthen our leaders Next year, there's going to be a monthly leader Zoom with Katie and I every month just to check in, to train, to equip for all of our leaders. Kind of keep strengthening our small groups uh, by strengthening our small group leaders. Want the hospitality culture to keep growing. Just having Sunday afternoons and evenings free is going to help that a lot. We've got some new Christian discipleship strategies. Just FYI on this next one, giving culture, when I teach on giving discipleship next year, um, don't be surprised because uh, that's discipleship, okay? So we are strengthening the giving culture. Same with serving, okay? So it's like, hold on a minute, got real quiet real quick. Um, strengthen the kids' ministry, some awesome stuff happening there, but we're going to keep strengthening it. Recovery, yeah, if you get the emails, you would have seen we're actually advertising for some new extra roles in recovery next year to strengthen that ministry. And young adults ministry for all our awesome young adults here. Um, hopefully you guys will help us figure out how to strengthen the young adults ministry. And we're going to start uh, night school. So in terms one, two, and three next year, quarters one, two, and three, night school will begin offering particular classes that anyone can go to or whole small groups can go to if they want. We're prioritizing next year. Alpha's gonna run a couple of times. A spiritual formation class is going to run. A ministry school is gonna run. A leadership school is gonna run. A theology school is gonna run. Parenting courses, relationship courses, money management courses, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. All in church prayer and worship meetings will happen once a month uh, next year. That's going to be awesome on Sunday nights. Serve Our Cities coming back. And there's a whole bunch of like overseas mission trips planned for next year that people can be a part of if you want to be a part of. And we'll, yeah, yeah, so this is next year. What do you guys reckon? Look, uh, 12 years and three months ago, Katie and I became the senior pastors of this church. It was 50 or 60 people. Um, I remember getting away with the Lord. And I remember just asking him, because it caught, a, caught us by surprise becoming the pastors, asking him what he wanted to do, asking him to give me like his heart for the future of this church. And I remember... God giving me a heart for a big church. And I, I know that God gave us a heart for a big church because he wanted this church to impact lots of people. I know that God gave us a heart for a big church because size affords you to be able to do a whole bunch of things. It allows you to raise people up and send people out and give lots of opportunities. And so we're still committed to those things. But I remember at the center of, the, of what God said was that he wanted to reach a lot of people through this church. And thankfully, we have reached a lot of people and continue to reach every week a lot of people through this church. But I remember praying a very earnest prayer at that time about, God, I don't want this church to grow because Christians jump ship from other churches or just move city. I want this church to grow because people meet you because people meet you that otherwise didn't know you. And the pastor, my pastor before me, he always said this. He always said, everyone loves to catch the fish and everyone loves to eat the fish, but nobody likes to clean the fish. Everyone likes to eat the fish. Everyone likes when, you know, everything's going well and people are discipled and flourishing in God. Everybody likes to catch the fish. It's a thrill seeing people come to know Christ. Filleting fish is messy business. Discipleship, it's the grit and grind of life on life, of real stuff, of teaching and immersing. And so as we go into next year, we just go into an appetite, a godly appetite of let's clean the fish. Let's fill it the fish. And yeah, we'll enjoy eating it, and we'll celebrate with the catching, but discipleship really is the messy work of cleaning the fish. Shall we stand and pray and commit the year to the Lord? Just if you're, if you're open to it, would you hold your hands out? Oh, Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Lord, we wanna be disciples of you. We wanna follow you wherever you lead. No turning back. The cross before us, the world behind us. No turning back. Lord, we, we take your word seriously that whoever tries to gain the whole world might actually forfeit their soul. But if we lose ourselves for you and your kingdom, that we might find who we truly are in you, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit would stir a greater hunger for you, Lord, in us. Stir us, Lord. Burn within us, Lord. Fan into flame, Lord, our life in you. God, as we as we step into discipleship, Lord, we even just open ourselves up even now in preparation for next year, Lord. And as we go into a break and a holiday season, Lord, speak. Lord, lead us, guide us. What do you need to teach us, Lord? Reveal it to us. What do you need us to give up, Lord? Reveal it to us. What practices do we need to begin? Call them out of us, Lord. What do we need to fast from, Lord? Challenge us, convict us. We just open ourselves up to the Spirit of God to lead us, Lord, as disciples. We're willing to follow, Lord, just lead us. And we just pray, Lord, over next year that everybody would be strengthened in You. Lord, that we really would become greater followers of You next year, Lord. And we pray that many people would come to know You and not just get saved, but get discipled and grow strong in the Lord and have a faith that would bear much fruit in the years to come in their life. So we commit all these things to our Rabbi, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. And it's in His Name we pray and it's for His glory we live. Amen. Amen.